here on Ancient Faith Radio. I'm glad you are with us. Uh, you may have heard in the transition, I shared that I was a little bit jealous with Alyssa, who uh, always has someone on the other side of the microphone to talk to. <laughs> and now I don't always have someone to talk to. Often I just have your questions by email. But nonetheless, uh, I'd love to hear from you tonight. We open up the program with wide open lines at one 855 237 23 Four, six. Of course, we always love speaking with you. And, um, you know, if you're listening to this as a podcast later on, you can always get to us by writing it at Orthodoxy Live at ancientfaith.com. And you can also get to us by um, going to ancientfaith.com and going to the live uh, button at the top of the website. Scroll down to Orthodoxy Live, click on the microphone button, and record a question for us there. Um, as always, we hope that you'll let your friends know about this program uh, and about all of the programming here on Ancient Faith. Um, let us know what you think and certainly share this with your friends. Um, if you haven't yet checked out the incredible sales <laughs> that are going on and books that uh, are available as we return to school on Ancient Faith Store, check that out. And a huge, big, massive plug for the brand new Ancient Faith Radio app that is out. Incredible. Check it out. I think you're going to love it. Um, now, uh, before I get to my first call, I just wanted to put the plug out there. My first book came out in 2020, Toolkit for Spiritual Growth. If you haven't yet picked up a copy, um, I think you'll really benefit from the reading of this book on prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. And my second book, Reclaiming the Great Commission, is due out most likely sometime in October uh, when we get a little bit closer to um, how the printer's doing, we'll let you know. It will be available here on Ancient Faith and all of those ways that you purchase books. If you're a digital purveyor uh, or, I'm sorry, uh, someone who likes to to read digitally, it's, it's going to be there. It'll also be in audible form as well. Again, um, you're listening to Orthodoxy Live on Ancient Faith. Got a couple open lines at one 237 2346 We're going to go out to the phones and take a call from Ben. Hi, Ben. Hello, Father Evan. How are you? Good, Ben. You must be calling from somewhere south. Oh, I was wondering if you'd pick up on that pretty quickly. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm in Texas. Yeah. Yes, sir. That also helps me know where you're calling from. Where Where yes, in sir. Texas, Ben? Well, I live in a small town called Whitesboro. Um, okay. It's about 60 miles north of Dallas. We're right Some on the north. Oklahoma border. Oh, no way. Okay. So you're past yes, what they call the Metroplex then, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Further north. So what's the closest parish? There is one in Denison, Texas, okay. which is probably 20 minutes from here, St. Paul's oh, Apostle. Okay. Is that, what jurisdiction is that? Uh, I don't know how to answer that question. I'm an inquirer. Oh, oh okay. Church, and <laughs> I've, I've visited for Vespers maybe three times. Gotcha, and gotcha. So, <laughs> well, so yes, you knew. Yeah, so so that question, you know, it's I'll be honest with you, it's it's something that as someone who grew up in the Orthodox Church and grew up in America, uh, there's a little sadness to that question for me because in America due to, you know, recent immigration, really, you know, some Orthodox churches and Orthodox people have really come in the last 20 years. Uh, that question jurisdiction means, you know, is the church under, let's say, the Romanians or the Greeks or the uh, Syrians or the Russians oh. or the Ukrainians? I mean, it's, um, it's a whole potpourri, uh, even the Orthodox Church of America. There's all sorts of uh, strains of churches that are all one church. It's all orthodoxy, but uh, sort of like people maybe would understand, you know, being Roman Catholic could be divided into Irish Catholic, Polish Catholic, that kind of thing. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. And I'm, now that you've kind of explained it a little bit, I'm more familiar with uh, <laughs> the terminology of what you're asking. And I'm trying to remember. Uh, I, I believe it's the Greek tradition. Oh, okay. Um, all right. Yeah. Well, it's nice to have you on the program, Ben. Um, what's your question for me? Well, I actually emailed you a couple of weeks ago in regards to a question my son had. Oh, Elam. that's okay. Elam. Ah, yeah, yeah. How yeah. old's your son? I've got him right here if you'd like to ask him. 
Well, hi, Elam. Welcome to Orthodoxy Live. Is this your first time on the radio? Oh, he's it, got, it is. I, I he's gotten he's shy on me. <laughs> he, he's, he's six years old, and, and this is the first time on a radio show, and it's kind of intimidating. Oh, so I'm sure him, it is. Nothing wrong with you, you know? Elam, but, I have to tell you something. Every time that um, music plays, I get nervous for the show. And I get butterflies in my stomach because I'm nervous to go on the radio. And I'm 53 years old, and I've done this show nine years. So if this is a first time on the radio, I would say I'd be nervous if I was you um, because it's the first time you've ever done something like this. But I'm glad you called. And uh, Elam, you'll have to tell me, what grade are you going into? Can you tell him what grade? Well, he's got he's, a full case. He's, he's going into first grade. <laughs> full yeah. case of stage fright. Well, I, yeah. I know. Has school started down in Texas? Yes, sir. We are. We started just last Wednesday, so he's, he's fresh into it. All right. Full day first grade. Well, that's a big thing. Well, I'd love to hear what he's got on his mind. And if and if it's easier for you, Ben, to kind of relate the question, that's fine. Yeah. You want to ask? You want me to? Me too? Okay. He wants me to ask, so I'll just ask. Oh, okay. Him. His question was, why did God choose to um, make Adam out of dirt? <laughs> that's a great question. I love that question. Um, so if we're looking in the book of Genesis, we hear of the creation of mankind uh, and the first man, Adam. Uh, and it says, uh, do you have your Bible close by? Uh, no, we don't have one open, actually. Okay. So, so depending on your translation, you know, you, you hear that creation story kind of said differently. And um, I'm going to see if I can get there in time to the creation of Adam and see what, uh, how my Bible is uh, translating it. So uh, let's see. Uh, it, does take, it does say that he took him uh, from the d dust of the earth, right? Does yours maybe say it that way? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, it's interesting because the original Greek word there... Um, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty nuanced. And so I'm going to see if I can do the best I can with explaining this to Elam and to you, Ben. Um, now, where you live in Texas, do you, do you see a lot of red dirt? Uh, yes, and the further north we, get, <laughs> north we go, we do. Yeah, you've got a lot of that, right, in Texas. And yes, have you driven on dirt roads with your son before? Elam, you've been on a dirt road with Daddy? Yes. Yes. And when you're going that dirt road, what happens to the dirt? If you look behind the it truck. Just goes, it just goes up in the air, doesn't it? You kind of notice it up in the air, right? You kind of see that dust hovering. And it's not really going up into the sky, and it's not really laying flat on the earth, but it's kind of hovering in between. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, in, in, the, in the word that's used in the Bible there for dirt, it actually means that dirt that's not quite laying on the ground and not quite floating up into the air, but hovering just above the surface of the earth. You know, I want you to imagine that for a minute. Now, of course, when God's creating humanity, he's not creating it in Texas after a truck is driven down a dirt road. <laughs> and so the idea that the Bible's giving us is that the dirt used to make humanity is somehow not exactly of the earth and not exactly of the heavens. It's kind of floating right between. Now, Ben, does that make sense to you? Yes, sir, it does. And, and so there's kind of a uniqueness to that. And if we think about what is a human being? Well, a human being is, is, some, is something that can exist on earth, right? You and I right now, Elam, where do we live? I live on earth. I live in a place called Colorado. And some Coloradans say that 
Colorado is closer to heaven than Texas. I don't know if you ever heard that before. <laughs> We're certainly higher up. <laughs> but um, I've heard people say that Texas is God's country, too. So uh, either way... Yeah. Either way, when we're talking about where we live, most of us would say, well, I live on planet Earth. And I might say, well, I live in Fort Collins, Colorado. In your case, uh, your dad will have to remind me what the name of your town is. Oh, uh, Whitesboro. Whitesboro, Texas, right? Which is yes. Yes. north of Dallas, 60 miles on the Oklahoma border. Okay. So that's where you live. But, you know, when we leave this Earth... Where are we going to go live? With God. Yeah, with God. And does God, does he live in what we call the heavens? Yes. Yeah, so we're going to go live in heaven with God. And so a human being, it's kind of like human beings are, you know, in a, in a way, kind of spiritual astronauts. We can live on earth and we can live in heaven. And while we're living on earth, our goal is to live in heaven. And when God created us, even when he created us, that intent was there. That's why he used that special dust that was hovering just above the earth, but not yet in heaven. Now, unfortunately, when God created us, um, we can go the other direction. We can go away from God, right? Have you ever Have you ever heard about that where people don't? want to follow God. They don't want to live with God. They don't want to follow God. Have you ever heard about that? Yes. Yeah. And, and, and they, they don't go to heaven. Uh, in fact, they don't even remain on earth. They actually go down to some place we call hell. That's a scary place, terrible place. None of us want to go there. And just like in creation, you know, where we're just above the earth, but not yet in heaven, unfortunately, we can make our way further away from God and even not to the earth, but below the earth. And that's why ancient Israel often, you know, the old Israelites, they would think about a place called Hades, the netherworld, as being below the earth. Um, now, Ben, I'm going to stop there, and, and Elam may not be able to process all this just at once, um, but... Do you have any follow-ups and, you know, does that make any sense to you? And were yeah, you a little yeah. shocked to find out that it's not just uh, your everyday word for dirt? Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. And, you know, I, I believe that kind of when you read it, you take more away from it than just being dirt, especially when mm -hmm. the language mm -hmm. of God breathing life into mm -hmm. the dust, you know, yeah. forming Adam. Yeah. It's almost like, man was supposed to live a little bit closer to heaven mm -hmm. than just the mm -hmm. dirt. Yeah. So, and, you yeah. know, there's this, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ben. No, I was just agreeing that that, that makes sense with what you're saying. Yeah. And, and there's a really interesting prayer practice in the church. And you may have seen it when someone maybe is saying their prayers and they're standing upright and then they'll bend at the waist and they'll touch their hand usually their right hand to the ground, and then they'll stand upright again and make the sign of the cross over their body, yes, starting at their head, down to their heart, to their right shoulder and their left shoulder. And that movement uh, recalls our creation in the Genesis story, that somehow humanity, which has its feet planted on the earth, can be looking upwards towards the heavens, you know, shoulders back, head upright, and beholding the celestial kingdom above us. But we know that often in life we stumble, we sin, we fall. And so instead of remaining upright, we head back down towards the earth. <laughs> and, and we bring our heart and our head back down to where our feet are. But then we can become upright again through the power of Christ and his cross, right? And become that being that once again can leave the earth and move into the heavens. And so that understanding of how we were created, what we're created for, your son's question is really at the root of the entire gospel, the entire story of Christ coming and redeeming humanity 
and reclaiming us for himself. So it's a beautiful, important, and powerful question. Never been asked on the show before, but I'm so glad, Elam, that you did. I, pr- I appreciate it. <laughs> you were very brave <laughs> to call in. And uh, thanks for asking such an important question, Elam. Thank you for the answer. You're welcome. And uh, I'm going to ask Dad. Dad, does does Elam have siblings? Oh, he has one uh, younger uh, sister who's about three months old. Oh, congratulations. So your sweet Thanks. wife is uh, busy. Yeah, we, yeah, it's been a, him being almost seven years old, it's been kind of, he's old enough now to kind of manage himself. And so now it's just getting back to bottles, back to diaper changes. And, All that. Yep. I remember but, it well. <laughs> <laughs> well, God bless you, Ben. I hope you'll check in and let us know how your journey is going. Oh, for sure. And my son said he's got a list of questions. I told him, so let's just ask this one and we'll call back in a couple of weeks. So Sounds great. Okay, Ben. Bye, Elam. Thank you. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Well, again, you're, orth- you're listening to Orthodoxy Live here on Ancient Faith Radio. What a great question to start with from Elam and Ben. Uh, we're going to go back out to the phones and take a call from Stephen. Hello, Father Stephen. Uh, pleasure to talk to you. Pleasure to talk to you, Stephen. Where are you calling from? Calling from New Jersey. New Jersey. So what part? Uh, Bergen County up on the northern tip. Okay. Bordering New York State. Okay. So I was in Ocean City. Is that sound right? Ocean sure. City? Yeah, yeah. A little further south by the beach area. Yeah, so there's a parish, St. George's. I visited there uh, during the Lenten season uh, and gave a retreat. I think the the retreat's found on the special section here on Ancient Faith Radio. But um, so, how far away are you from there? Probably about an hour and twenty minutes. Oh, a fair amount. Is where you yeah. live? Is it rural or urban? It's, uh, no, it's rural, but. Um... You know, it's probably 45 minutes to Manhattan. Or actually, it's only about 25 miles, depending on traffic. But we have a lot of Orthodox (laughs) uh, churches up here. We have OCA, Greek, Antiochian, so pretty lucky. Yeah, where do you attend? I attend the uh, Antiochian Church in Bergenfield, St. Anthony, and I'm uh, originally a member of the Carpatho-Russian Diocese. Well, wonderful. It's nice to have you on the program. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Thank you, Father. My question has to do, you know, now that we just completed the Dormition, Mm -hmm. is there any um, legitimacy regarding, there's a book out there or or there's a old manuscript, St. Maximus the Confessor on the Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? To a degree, yes, to a degree. Is that acceptable reading information, or is it just, you know, not worth even reading? Well, you know, the, the, there are many incredible experts on St. Maximus the Confessor. One of them uh, teaches at Holy Cross Seminary. Uh, his name is uh, Father Maximus. He was named after his patron, St. Maximus the Confessor. And I would say that anything you can read from St. Maximus is worth reading. He okay. is one of the great fathers of the church and one of the great uh, confessors of the faith is a good way of putting it. Uh, someone who explains and, and extrapolates and articulates what our faith teaches, right? Um, and so I sense within your, your question, you know, kind of a probing about, is it around Mary and the Dormition? You know, I, I haven't read it, but um, there was a book out there by a gentleman named Stephen Shoemaker, who I think is a, a Catholic individual who translated it into mm-hmm. a book. And, and then when I was doing some further research, it seemed to indicate that it was probably not written by St. Maximus, mm-hmm. but I never heard of, uh, you know, I've always heard of St. Maximus, the confessor, but never heard about this particular document. And I didn't uh-huh. know if it was in line with uh, Spurious what or not. the Apostle of James or, you uh, know, right, the, right. Uh, Evangelia. Right. 
which yeah, we I get mean, a lot of our liturgic from, but, you know, it's obviously uh, apocryphal. Yeah, I mean, the the thing about it, of it is, is that I, I am not a scholar, right? But what I could tell you uh, is that, you know, St. Maximus, you know, let's, let's give you a sense of, of some of the accepted works, right, of St. Maximus the Confessor, you know, on the cosmic mystery of Jesus Christ. Uh, he's got a work on, you know, 200 chapters on theology, uh, right. ecclesiastical mystagogy, um, the life of the Virgin. That's the book that you're thinking of, right? That's um, correct, yeah. Yeah, and and it, it, it's understandable that you know some you know wonder i like i said i'm not a i'm not an expert in this reality of what saint maximus uh wrote or didn't write and what i would say is i i can do a little checking for you um because i know who to ask and you know okay. what i can do is sort of give a, a report next week you know i can that i can great. find out from uh you know, Father Maximus about the book and say, now, is this an accepted work in Orthodox circles? Um, and perhaps I'm going to have a savvy listener who, who knows more about, uh, and as you said, you know, it's, it's an important question, right? So your question is, look, is this an acceptable work in the church? And some people might be questioning what you mean by that, right? Yeah. And there are ancient Christian texts that either have been rejected by the church, right? Uh, because uh -huh. their content was deemed dangerous and heretical, right? And then there are books of questionable authorship, and right. they may be accepted by the church, right? Um, just because we don't know exactly who wrote them, we may say this is an acceptable work that we can read in the church, but we're not sure of its authorship, right? Um, yeah. And, and then there are works that are meant to basically be uh, uh, forged, in a sense, to sort of sway us. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're imposters, you know, so to speak. Um, but I think, you know, the general theology of the church related to the Dormition, you know, the safest place to look for what the church teaches is in the hymns and prayers that surround the feast and the readings. Absolutely. Right? This is where we know for certain this church is speaking with clarity, you know, and so, you know, in our recent celebration of the feast here in our own parish, I had to distinguish for some of our, our parishioners that as Orthodox, we do not speak of Mary's assumption in the way that many Western Christians might, that she was assumed before her dying into the heavens, right? right? And some people will ascribe to that theology, and the church says, no, Mary died, just as every human being has died besides Enoch and Elijah, <laughs> right? right. Um, and she has a feast of her falling asleep. That's what the chemesis means in Greek or yep. dormition in English, right? And often in the icon, when we see if if you can if you can view that icon in your mind's eye of Mary um, and Christ, her body is shown laid out as she's reposed and asleep, but her soul has been taken yes. by Christ, right? Um, yep, absolutely. So we'll say in the hymn, you know, that the mother of life has passed from death into life. That's the hymn of the feast, you know? Yeah. So, so Stephen, it looks like I got a little homework to do. <laughs> Father, if you don't mind, I'd really appreciate it. I don't want to buy the book and then not read it. So I will wait uh, until I hear it next week. I'll uh, tune in as I always do. Well, what I'll do is, I, I like I said, I know I know who to check. If I can't get Father Maximus, I, one of his uh, beloved uh, students is a member of my community, and he's in close communication with him and took his class on St. Maximus the Confessor while he was in seminary. So he's our new deacon, Deacon Nicholas. 
Uh, I, I will say this, a little plug for Deacon Nicholas. He gave his first homily today at our parish. And so if you have a chance, if you're listening tonight, go to uh, YouTube and, and look up St. Spirit on Orthodox Church in Loveland, Colorado, and listen to his homily. He, he spoke yep. beautifully. Uh, so anyway, Stephen, thanks for calling. Nice to have you on the program. Thank you. Really appreciate it, Father. Have a uh-huh. great week. Okay, you too. We're going to take a short break. As we go to break and Stephen drops off, it does open up lines for you at 1 855 237 2346. We'll be back after this break. Orthodoxy Live with Father Evan will be back in a moment. In the meantime, lines are open at 1 855 AF Radio. That's 1 855 237 2346. New from Ancient Faith Publishing Secret Turning. A collection of short stories by Stephen Signori. So I'm out in the lot of Lord of Heaven, and up comes Father Naum from behind, grabs me, gives me a kiss, and tells me he's happy to see me. Wearing his worn-out dungaree bib overalls with the beat-up straw Stetson, pulling his wire basket, going shopping on the avenue. How old is Naum anyway? Sharky asked. Older than he acts, Lefty said. Two beer red, he said, yeah, and younger than he seems. So he says to me, Theodri, the church is much better when you're there. It's not the whole family when we don't see you. You know, God misses his children, and Nana Olga misses her son. Now available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook at store.ancientfaith.com. Father Evan is ready for your call, and our lines are open at 1-855-AF-RADIO. That's 1-855-237-2346. Here once again is Father Evan. Well, welcome back to the show. And as we went to break, I mentioned we've got a few open lines for you. If you'd like to call in with your question, we're going to go out to John. John, welcome to the program. Hi. Hey, John. I, I had a feeling it was... The John I know from Denver. It's good to see, good to hear your voice, John. Yeah. Um, hey, thanks for visiting us. By the way, a couple of weeks ago. Oh yeah. Are you are you still out on your travels? No, no, not yet. I head off to Ancient Faith next week. Ah, wonderful. So you're still at home, yeah. and then then you'll make your big road trip. Yeah. So. Well, it's good to hear your voice. Yeah. So. Oh. I was listening earlier with Elam asking the, um, or having his dad ask questions, <laughs> questions like that. And I have a one that uh, small T tradition type thing. Uh, uh-huh. Some some of the Orthodox churches, like the Greek. I mean, we just go up for communion and we're there. But some of them, uh, the tradition is to cross your arms over your yes. chest. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah, uh huh. Wondering where that comes from. Well, very, very interesting tradition as 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 you've seen some people make the cross and and just so again for people in their mind's eye, uh, in an Orthodox service, the service on Sunday is what we call a divine liturgy. It's focused on the celebration of our Lord's resurrection, the exposition of the good news, and the calling down of the Holy Spirit to consecrate the bread and the wine that is offered into the body and blood with the faithful being invited to come forward to receive the Holy Eucharist um, at the conclusion, basically, of the service. And as people come forward, the clergy are arrayed outside of the altar and the faithful come forward to receive the Eucharist. And some will come forward, and as they do so, they'll place their left hand on their right shoulder and so their elbow is near their midsection and they'll place their right hand on their left shoulder and so it's right over left it can be left over right it doesn't really matter there but if you look at that it's sort of forming like a cross right and and so the faithful may come forward and and do that uh before receiving communion now there's a lot to say here, John, believe it or not. <laughs> um, one, of, one of the reasons that people do that is practical. Because um, clergy 
as they're holding the body and blood, uh, don't like to have people making movements that are perhaps uncontrolled or erratic uh, around the chalice for fear that they may hit the chalice and unfortunately tip it in such a way that some of the body and the blood may come out of the chalice, right? So there's, there is a practical reason if someone places their arms like that, especially little children, it kind of keeps them from moving in such a way as that they would disturb the chalice, okay? There's also the idea that when doing so, you're forming, as I said, the sign of the cross, which is always a good thing <laughs> to, to recall the cross of Christ. Uh, and there is another uh, reality that's more attached to um, some of the iconography in the church. Um, so let me see if I can explain this. Have you seen, you know, at, at Holy Week, we process a tapestry on um, Good Friday that we call uh, the Epitaphios. Have you, have you ever looked at that tapestry? Yes. Yeah. So, so for people who are unfamiliar with it, it is a, can be, you know, kind of a, uh, an icon that's been done, uh, on, on, let's say a fabric. And oftentimes it's a woven, you know, sort of embroidered, uh, depiction, but it depicts the passion of Christ as of his burial. And, and the term epitaphios simply means that which is placed upon the tomb. And so in the Holy Week service, it depicts Christ being laid in the tomb, and we process that tomb, and we, we relive the burial of Christ, okay? Now, if you look at that tapestry or if you look at that icon or embroidery, however your church has it, if you've never seen one, you can probably Google Orthodox Epitaphios. You may only see the external tomb, which is uh, decorated in flowers, you know, often a wooden structure, but it's inside there uh, laid on the flat portion of that structure is this Epitaphios. And if you look at the the depiction of that, um, you'll see Christ laid out. And there is often erroneous depictions of him showing him with his arms crossed over his body, like someone coming for communion. Okay? And that's actually incorrect. His arms are to be shown at his side. Okay? And the reason for that is that Someone with their arms crossed is understood to be a unwilling sacrifice. <laughs> and someone with their arms to the side is understood as a willing sacrifice. So Christ goes to the cross. He gives his life and into the tomb willingly, we say, right? He, of his own free choice, right? And so when we think about ourselves, <laughs> we can add this layer and say, as I go forward, do I go willingly or unwillingly? <laughs> and, you know, we're a mixture of both, aren't we? Yes. <laughs> so, so, so there's another layer, right? Um, uh, to the folding of one's arms over one's chest. And, you know, I'm sure there are other meanings that can be ascribed uh, to it, um, but I think it's important to just keep in mind that that other aspect, which may not necessarily be associated with the reception of the Eucharist, but it, it does speak to, you know, the reality of our Christian walk, that, you know, we, we do struggle with being willing versus unwilling, you know, being obedient versus disobedient with you know, walking in Christ with joy, you know, and directed towards the cross or kind of being drug along, you know? Um, so something to think about. Thanks, John. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for that uh, question. Yeah. And, uh, well, sa safe, safe travels. Okay. We'll see you sometime next time I come up there. <laughs> <laughs> I would love it. Okay. Bye, John. Okay. So my friend John, who, who lives down in Denver, 
uh, visited us up here in, in uh, Loveland at St. Spiridon's a few weeks ago and, and does a lot of engineering work actually for Ancient Faith Radio and is headed out to their studios uh, to work on things. So we're going to go out to the phones again and take a call from TJ. TJ, you there? Hello, Father Evan. How are you this evening? Well, I'm great. How are you? I am doing wonderfully. Thank you very much. <laughs> where, 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 where are you calling from? You know, I'm calling from Geneva, Illinois, which is about 35 uh, miles west of Chicago. So, what does What does TJ stand for? Uh, Theodore James. I'm, I'm a junior, and my dad went by Ted, and they didn't want to call me Teddy, so they said Theodore. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> I've got a, yeah. I got you. I got a story like that. So I was named after my grandfather. His name was Evangelos. Uh-huh. And in America, you went by Angelo. And my mother just, uh-huh. I don't know, she hated the name Angelo. So she said, we're not going to call him that. We're going to call him Evan, uh, which is actually Welsh and means John. So, oh, I got you. Got you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was, my, my dad was a huge Green Bay Packers fan, and I was almost named after a, a Packers player whose name was Boyd. And my mother refused to be call me Boyd. So that's how we get Theodore, Theodore Jr. So. That's so funny. Well, I, I'll tell you. So, so if you're if you're in Illinois and you're a mm-hmm. Packers fan, how did that happen? Uh, I'm actually not a Packers fan. This is oh, you're not with the family. So, oh. I was born in Wisconsin. I was born in Wisconsin. I moved down here back in the late '60s when I was about four years old, and I became a Bears fan to the discontent of my father, who was of a course. Huge Packers fan. Of course, <laughs> and of course, grew up during the Lom- you know, was 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 uh, you know was you know the Lombardi era was strong when he was you know, yeah yeah was yeah. Man, so, but now in the well, family, I've got my I have a son who's a Bears fan, and then I have a son who's a Packers fan. I have a, <laughs> I have a sister and her children who are who are Bear, Packers fans. So it's a it's kind of a it's kind of a mess in our family. We, we don't we don't discuss football in our family. So. Yeah. So so for those who are listening from overseas, uh, this all has to do with uh, pro football, uh, the kind that Americans play, and the teams that are located in different parts of the country. And uh, you know the the station manager for Ancient Faith Radio, Bobby Maddox, is a huge Bears fan. So way back when this program first got started, uh, we'd get on air. And and when we go on break, he would turn the studio mics on, and I could hear him and the guys working the show listening to the Bears game. <laughs> and uh, it was a little distracting. And then he would he would he would update me. You know, if the Broncos were playing, he'd send me a text. You know, the Broncos are down or whatever. You know, and it was like this is not good. You know, I don't need I don't need this sort of distraction while I'm trying to, to be on air. But one last story about football, and then we'll, we'll get to your question. So this summer, uh, we had uh, one of my my friend, my daughter's friends uh, live with us. Um, she had an internship up here in northern Colorado, and she's from southern Colorado. So she stayed with us for the summer. Her family's from Wisconsin. Uh, and she was born here in the state in, in Colorado. But but they're all you know, huge Packers fans. So she showed up with her Packers gear, you know, and she is, they're so crazy for the Packers that when Brett Favre left the Packers, her mother didn't watch a, a Packers game for like two years. She just couldn't do it. Oh my goodness. (laughs) Anyway, well, TJ, tell me your question. Well, you know, I've been a, so I've been attending an Orthodox church for a, a while now. It's actually, it's been about six years, and um, I, you know, I go in and I, I was raised Catholic, so uh-huh. I, you know, I, it's you know, when I when I first started attending the church, I was like, well, this is kind of like you know, it's kind of like cousins. You can see uh-huh. the similarities, but then there's differences too. But one of the things that um, that I started to do was to, that I would go ahead and light a candle when I first uh-huh. walked in, like, uh-huh. Uh-huh. and. Um, you know, it started out that I would just kind of say a personal prayer, and then I would say, uh-huh. I'd say maybe a trisagi on then, uh-huh. a personal prayer or something uh-huh. like that. And I started to kind of look, and I can't find, is there, I guess my question is, is there any type of prayer that you're supposed to say when you hmm. go in and first light the candle? <laughs> uh, like I said, I've done a little bit of research online, but I can't really seem to find anything. Yeah, yeah. That gives me a type of definitive answer. So. Well, it's a beautiful question. And it's a question that um, it's, I had a young couple uh, at church today 
uh, who is investigating the church. And the wife, uh, Rachel, said, you know, I'd love uh, for you to give me a little bit of a tour of the sanctuary and help me understand what people are doing because we've been a few Sundays and I I'm, and I missed your church tour. So I, twice a year, I give a church tour in our Intro to uh, Orthodoxy class. And a uh, little plug for that: if you if you get the time, TJ, okay. uh, and you go if you go to I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of say this nice and slow for people who who might want to okay. check this out. So if you go to Saint Spirit on Dot Church. So Saint Spirit on Dot Church, and you go to the media button. Um, you'll see in the drop down, there's a there's an intro to Christianity course, and if people click on that, and uh, they they'll go to another page and they'll see uh, a series of lectures, and um, in there, uh, unfortunately. Uh, you know, the, I, I would say these lectures are worth listening to, but you're you're not going to find the church tour. So, and you're saying, well, why did you take me there? Well, because when people go here, that's usually the first place they'll go. So, if you go to the podcast portal and you click there, uh, and again, you can go back and listen to this. I'm not expecting you to remember all this. You can go to the podcast archive, and from the archive, there are these classes. And again, you'll find the Intro to Orthodoxy class. When you click on that, there is a tour, a church tour. And I, I recommend people take a listen to that because I'll talk about the progression into the church and what it means. Now, for purposes of your call, let's talk through what's going on. So when you arrive in an Orthodox church uh, and you walk into a space that is, in American parlance, we call it like a vestibule. But in the church language, we call it a narthex, right? And it's a, trans, it's a transition space between the world and, if you will, the kingdom of God, okay? And as you walk in, typically an Orthodox church is going to be facing Jerusalem, you know, towards the east, you know, the city of God, or facing east towards the rising sun, which means you've placed the west to your back, now, that's significant to the question you've asked, because the West is the place from which darkness comes. Okay? So we place okay. our backs to the West, we move to the East, and the darkness is at our back, and we're heading towards the light. Now, when you walk into the church, as you know, the first thing that's occurring is you're going over and you're receiving the light from a candle. Now, I said it that way. Most people say, well, I'm lighting a candle, Father. And I say, no, you're not lighting a candle. You're receiving the light. Because when you get to the church, you don't go get a book of matches, strike a match, light your candle, and plunk it into the sandbox. Instead, right. the candles are lit. If you're the first one there, there's one candle lit. And you're receiving the light from that light. Okay? Right. Now... When we read the opening of the Gospel of John, right, we read about Christ as light. And this is significant because this is the reading that accompanies the Feast of Feasts, you know, Easter or what we call Pascha, right? right. And, and here's, here's the key point I want to make. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. I'm reading the first few verses of John. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of humanity. Okay? So what is the prayer that a Christian should be saying as they enter the church? It should be a prayer centered around the receiving of light from Christ who is the light of humanity. And so there are many passages, obviously, in John's gospel, but throughout Scripture that reference this idea of the light and how Christ the light illumines our darkness. So that's the prayer that 
I would say is probably the most central, Christ the light who illumines our darkness. In fact, one of the icons, primary icons of the church is Christ the light giver. Okay. So okay. If, have you been to the Paschal service, TJ? Yes, I, yes, I have. Uh-huh. So you'll remember the church is darkened. Mm-hmm. All of the lamps and candles are extinguished except one. And the priest comes out and he says, come receive the light from the light, right. which does not wane Christ. And when then, and then that light is spread through the congregation, right? right? So I would say, TJ, as you go in, that is the prayer that I would have on my heart is that I'm coming to okay. receive the light of Christ. Now, right. we, we need to add a, a coda, a little asterisk. <laughs> you you may have noticed that people will light vigil candles or seven day candles um, and mm-hmm. have them placed, you know, up near an icon or near the altar. Have you seen that? Uh, yeah, I have. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah, and th- that's a tradition even within Catholic parishes, right? Yeah. And yeah, people. We'll do that, right? And there's a little distinction right. there. There's a distinction of you know I've received the light of Christ. And now I'm taking this offering candle, this prayer request, and I'm placing it before God um, for him to respond to. And, and someone makes kind of a pilgrimage, you know, when they're lighting that candle. And, you know, for my, my dear friends that are Protestant, they kind of scratch their head at all this. They say, what, what is this, lighting candles and walking them and leaving them? It doesn't matter. And I'll say, well, you know, in Scripture, when God visits Abraham— his, his name is Abram at the time. And he says to Abram, get up and go to a place that I will show you. And he, he makes his pilgrimage, right? right? And when we get to the church, it's like a pilgrimage. Uh-huh. We're, le- we're leaving the world. We're going towards God and his kingdom. And, and that making of an offering and the leaving of a candle is an extension of that pilgrimage to God, Right. Um, and yep. so that's why the church practices it. But um, TJ, what of your question did we not answer, or anything that you're still I, wondering about? I think I think you pretty much hit on all the highlights of it. So that's see, I was just one of those things you like. <laughs> you know, I, like I like the candle, I pray, and it's like the first couple times I did it, I'm like, okay, so what, I, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to do yeah. it. Yeah, you know? yeah, <laughs> yeah. I understand. So, but, well, TJ, I hope you'll call in again, check in, and let me know how you're right. doing. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. And I ask that could you can you do me a favor too, Father? Yeah. I've got a um, I've got a wife who is very much uh, well. She's raised Baptist, and she has a very tough time with the with the Orthodox Church. So uh-huh. I um, I have not uh, I have not been able to to advance to um, you know becoming chrismate or anything like sure, that. I just sure. Sure. You pray for her. I've actually been going to. I've actually been. Uh, um, not going to divine liturgy, but I have been going to uh, Saturday evening vespers. Vespers going to church with my wife. Yeah, understandable. So, um, yes, yeah, indeed, so. I will pray. Okay, thank you so much, Father. Okay, all right, TJ. Thanks for calling. Bye bye. Well, thank you, TJ, and and you know, I, I want you as listeners to know that I definitely have you in my prayers as I as I prepare to serve the Sunday liturgy. Um, I've got a prayer list that I uh, go through each and every Sunday liturgy and and whenever I celebrate during the weekday. And I do have the listeners of this program uh, listed, uh, as I do, if you will, the staff and the uh, contributors uh, and, and the podcasters, if you will, and bloggers of ancient faith in this ministry. So you are in my prayers for sure. Uh, and especially for those that are inquiring and looking into the church. I understand the difficulty that that journey can be for many. Um, so we've got another question that came in uh, by email this week from Kimberly, who's an inquirer. And she says, hi, Father Evan, my cell phone's uh, quality is pretty unpredictable. So I thought I would email my question to you. I've been attending a Greek Orthodox Divine Liturgy for almost five months, and I hope to be chrismated next year. So chrismation, baptism, uh, is the means by which someone is initiated into the church as Christ has directed. If someone's been baptized in the name of the Trinity uh, and the bishops of the church deem that baptism to be valid, they're not brought in by 
baptism, but they're brought in through anointing with holy chrism and confession of their sins and of the faith. So that's what she's referencing there. Could you walk me through the how-tos of venerating icons? I see people doing different things before and after liturgy, making prostrations, which are called matanias in Greek, crossing themselves three times, crossing themselves once, bowing but not kissing the icon. Uh, and are women supposed to keep their hair from touching the icon when kissing it? Thank you in advance for your help. Your podcast has been a tremendous resource. Well, thanks, Kimberly. You know, look, a lot of times we can feel like we're doing something right or wrong. And I am so frequent in telling people, you're not doing anything wrong. Uh, you're trying to understand and live your faith and appropriate uh, a tradition, liturgical tradition, that dates to the time of the apostles. So no one going into the church should feel like they've got it all down, including myself. I learned something after my assistant priest, Father Gabriel, returned from Jerusalem about the vesting of the chalice and the disc uh, before the service of the divine liturgy that I didn't know. Uh, so I'm still learning things, and uh, so it's okay to bumble around and do the best we can. One of the things I would tell you is please check out my book, Toolkit for Spiritual Growth. I talk about uh, venerating icons and uh, making prostrations and, uh, and how to do that. Uh, Toolkit for Spiritual Growth, uh, Practical Guide to Prayer, uh, Fasting, and Almsgiving. Now, that being said, I'll give you a, a short answer here, Kimberly. I mentioned the making of a matanya or a prostration in the opening question to this program. And what its purpose is, is to recall our fall and then our redemption in Christ and being standing upright before God through the grace and forgiveness and redemption of Jesus Christ and his cross. Um, this is clearly uh, retold to us in the story of the prodigal who stands upright from the pig pen. Now, you can make a full prostration, which is to go to the ground, touch your head, or you can just touch your hand and make that sign of that cross. And Greeks call it a metania, which means a repentance, a turning, right? Well, the beginning opening of Christ's words, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, to return to God, to leave our ways that are wayward and disobedient, okay? Now, as we make that prostration, um, we often make that prostration in front of an icon, you know, an icon of our Lord. And we can make one prostration, we can make three, we can make 20, we can make seven. It doesn't really matter. Um, that we're making the prostration and recognizing our disfigurement, our fall, and then our standing upright in Christ is what matters. And we make the sign of the cross over ourselves, and then we go to venerate the icon. And when we venerate the icon, we typically kiss the hem, the foot, the hand, right? In deference and humility, right? If we are kissing the Lord, we wouldn't go kiss him on the face, um, but rather we would kiss him probably at his feet, you know, as a sign of humility and of repentance, uh, of our own lowliness, uh, and of our own reverence and veneration of Christ, right? Um, and, you know, as far as one's hair touching the icon, there's, there's no prohibition there, of course. I do think it's helpful if you're wearing, like, you know, if a man's wearing chapstick, you know, because it's a dry place that he lives in, or a woman's wearing uh, lip gloss or lipstick, it's nice to dab that and wipe that off so that it doesn't damage uh, the icon as those oils from those uh, products can, can, can ruin, you know, the, the icon. So it's good to dab that off. Um, other than what I've mentioned here, that's how we would do it. Now, you know, if you want to be very formal, you know, it typically tends to be three prostrations or two, a kiss. You say, well, you know, specific, why is it three or two? <laughs> because there's no real specific way. And then you'll back up and make one final prostration. So you can make three, venerate the icon, step back, make one. Or you can make two, venerate, step back, make one. That would be sort of a formal way of venerating the icons. And if you do that up at your icon screen, it's the same. Okay, God bless, Kimberly. Thanks for listening, and uh, keep your questions coming. We're going to go out to Josh as we close out the program. Josh, welcome to the program. Hey, Father Evan, how are you? Good, welcome. Where are you calling from, Josh? I'm calling from uh, Houston, Texas. Well, welcome to the program. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I listen to you uh, pretty religiously. Uh, yeah, no pun intended. <laughs> but, uh, 
Uh, I actually don't. I don't listen live. I, t- I typically tend to listen um, with after there. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So it's, it's such a blessing. So um, well, joy to so speak my, to you. Yeah, definitely. Just honored to kind of uh, star starstruck a little bit because I always listen to your voice, but now <laughs> I like to talk live, so it's kind of cool. So, um, Bob, my question is about. Um, so I'm Oriental Orthodox, and mm-hmm. so we. Um, one of the things I'm kind of wondering about is like kind of the frequency in which we should be um, taking communion. Um, so, uh, you know, for example, like I know that a lot of people in our church typically just take communion. Like if they if they don't come to evening prayer, if they don't have you really done the prayers and they show up to church and the priest is giving out the you know the prayer for absolution, mm-hmm. they just kind of run up there. And take it, and I raise my hand. I'm definitely one of them sometimes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, know, you know, I'm not judging them. You know, but at the same time, there's there's these like attending evening prayers and doing all mm-hmm. the prayers beforehand and doing all that stuff in order to make mm-hmm. sure you're properly prepared. Sure. And so, like, how do we balance? That? Mm-hmm. Because I think, like, for for myself, if I'm getting a church like in just enough time to get the absolution prayer, it, I think it's a good thing to take it. But at the same time, like. I have this fear that, like, am I spiritually dead inside mm-hmm, because I'm mm-hmm. taking I'm taking part in the body and blood of Christ mm-hmm. like, unprepared lately? Right. 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 And there's also like, how can I truly prepare? Right. No matter what I do, to prepare, I'm still not really ready. Right. Because <laughs> obviously we're we're kind of sinful in in inclination. Right. So that I, yeah. that's kind of like, how do we do that? Great question, Josh. So first of all, don't be starstruck. I'm I'm sitting here in in the basement studio <laughs> next to my kids uh, bins of legos and so <laughs> um, so josh the the question about um how often or how frequently we should receive we need to be clear that in the time of the fathers of the church like basil and john and gregory they received communion daily oh, wow. and and so, you know, the Eucharist was to be received daily by faithful Christians because we would say to ourselves, when would we not want to commune with Jesus our Lord? <laughs> and the obvious answer was never. We always want to commune with Jesus our Lord. And so sure. there developed a, a sort of errant practice for historical reasons. For example, in many of the churches of the Byzantine East that were overrun by Islam, the ability to receive the Eucharist was curtailed by persecution and destruction of of churches. And so the church, you know, said to the faithful, well, listen, we understand you can't get to the Eucharist daily or weekly, so no less than twice a year. (laughs) <laughs> the unfortunate reality oh, wow. was that as we came out of that persecution, many of the faithful retained this as a tradition, capital T, that we only received twice a year. That's how I grew up. And mm. crazy, but in the midst of all of that, St. Nicodemus, who compiled the Philokalia, <laughs> so heady stuff, right? St. Nico- yeah, Nicodemus, yeah, yeah. he wrote a, a treatise to say to Christians, uh, you must receive all the time. And the book is called On Frequent Communion. <laughs> and so wow. he was he was restoring the correct practice that we receive the Eucharist. And notice that when the Lord uh, gives us the teaching on the Eucharist, he says, receive, eat. But he puts it in the infinitive imperative command, meaning always be receiving, always be eating okay. uh, the Eucharist. So let's establish that the Eucharist is to be received constantly. And in fact, okay. there is a canon of the church, you know, a teaching that says, if you go more than three weeks without receiving, you have excommunicated yourself. That's what excommunication oh, wow. means. You're, you're not in wow. communion with Christ. You know, it's sort of like saying I'm married, but I haven't been home for three weeks and I don't know what my wife's up to. <laughs> and then I'm not married, am I? Yeah, and so, wow. so the church says, if you go that long, there should be some process of restoring yourself to communion mm-hmm. with the Lord. Now, proper preparation, you know, is something that we know we must do because St. Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that the reception of the body or the blood brings in an unworthy matter, brings judgment, even sickness 
or death. So you're right to say, I, I should do my best to prepare, right? Um, mm -hmm. But you can become scrupulous. You can say, well, you know, I, 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 I glanced at my watch during prayer, and so my mind came off God, I'm not worthy, you know. Well, mm -hmm. that is an error too, right? Because then we sure. are no longer, longer relying on the mercy of God, but relying on our own righteousness or self constructed righteousness. So there's a balance. Proper sure. preparation, repentance, acts of kindness and love towards those who are poor and in need, our fasting, our prayer, our following of the commandments. I'm giving a list. A reading of Scripture, sure. uh, our daily watch over our lives, right? Our confession sure. of sin. Sure. Um, to be balanced with, yes, I'm going to stumble, I'm going to fall. Now, in the Oriental tradition, as I understand, the prayer of absolution is typically read the day before, right? Or is um, it during the liturgy? So, is it during the liturgy? So what happens? So what happens? So like usually that's Saturday evening for vespers. Yes, we have right. More, we have evening prayer, mm -hmm. and then um, during we have morning prayer, yeah. and then we have the actual divine liturgy. liturgy. So yeah. during during morning prayer, the prayer says the prayer for absolution, and then also given. like yeah. So we also at the same time when we do there's also like uh, advise that you do confession. So the confession yeah. prayer that the priest reads and the absolution prayer is the same thing. So yeah. you know you can kind of knock out two versions of one stone <laughs> if you want. But usually yes. it's done during morning prayer. So yeah. got it. Okay. So so traditionally speaking, and in 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 the church, it has been understood that one gives confession, you know, frequently, but not daily. Sure. So we take our time to give our confession and receive that prayer of forgiveness, at least in my view, four to six times a year. Okay. Um, yeah. if, if we're attempting to receive that absolution and confession weekly, it's probably not going to occur. Now, in the liturgical tradition of the Oriental Orthodox Church, that prayer of absolution is read, as you mentioned, in the service. And so to be present for it, it is certainly worth being present for. Now, yeah. you also have a series of readings, right, um, that mm -hmm. precede the, the reception of the Eucharist. And oftentimes that also becomes a benchmark. Like, were you there to hear the readings from the epistles and from the Gospels and sure. the Psalms, right? Sure. Now, in the sure. end of the day, again, our, our conscience has to be some of a gu somewhat of a guide here as it is illumined so that we're not erring on the side of legalism, and we're not erring on the side of spiritual neglect and laziness. Mm -hmm. And there's somewhere in between. And again, our conscience, our heart typically can guide us in knowing, you know, I, I really have not even attempted to prepare worthily for the reception of the Eucharist, yeah. you know, and we yeah. know, okay, I showed up late. I didn't fast this week. I didn't say my prayers. Probably I should refrain, but sure. let me take up this life and, and, and uh, be ready next time the, the Eucharist is, mm -hmm. is offered. So, Josh, right. I, I love hearing from you. Thank you for calling me. Thank you. What's the name of the parish? Uh, we go to, I go to, so we go to St. Gregorius Orthodox Church. It's Gregorius, St. of course. St. Gregorius, yeah. of course. Yeah. That's so wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Are you are you are you aware like he's from uh, India originally? Uh, yes. Are you, are you, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, of course. I've I've got dear friends uh, in the Chicago area that uh, that I've I've become familiar with and and priests yeah. that uh, are serving in the Coptic Orthodox Church that just have taught oh, me so nice. much. So it's been a beautiful yeah. relationship. So thanks, Josh, for calling. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me okay. on. I, uh -huh. I definitely appreciate it. Have, have a blessed week. You too. Bye bye. Well, as we close out, we thank you for listening. You know, this has been your show about the Orthodox faith, her life, her teachings, and her traditions. And I'm your host, Father Evan. Um, we hope that you'll be with us again next week. And if you missed any part of this program, you can pick it up as a podcast. I um, want to thank Matushka Trudy, who's in the booth tonight, for producing and engineering the show for Ancient Faith Radio and Orthodoxy Live. I'm Father Evan. Good night and God bless. Mm -hmm.